Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining today, the uh, seventh of nine lectures on this virtual PhD course on urban economics in developing countries. Um, as those of you returning will know, this course is co-hosted by the Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of Development and of course the International Growth Centre. Wonderful to have so many of you back again this week. Um, for those of you who are joining for the first time, um, my name is Victoria Delbridge and I head up the IGC Cities That Work initiative. I'll be chairing today's lecture, which will be focusing on the very exciting and rapidly growing field of spatial methods and models. Um, so to teach us something about this, we're very privileged to be joined today by Stephen Redding, Professor of Economics at Princeton University, as well as Nick Sivanides, Assistant Pro uh, Professor at UC Berkeley. Um, the hour of lectures will be followed by 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A. And as usual, uh, before we get started, I'm just gonna run through a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so firstly, if anyone would like to act as a live participant this week, uh, I'm sure many of you know the drill by now, um, you'll have access to your uh, microphone and video, and you'll be able to interact verbally during the Q&A. Please, uh, if you could virtually raise your hand now and Greg will select a few of you to join the discussion. For any other participants, if you have any questions, please do type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. You can submit these questions at any point during the discussion. Um, and it would be great if you could uh, include your name and your organizational affiliation when you write those questions. Um, you can also upload other people's questions that you particularly like by clicking the thumbs up icon. Um, I'd like to note that we'll be recording all the lectures in this series, and these recordings will be made available on the IGC's website, along with the slides and reading lists from the lectures as well. And finally, for those who attend at least seven lectures in the series, you will be issued with a certificate on the completion of the course. Um, so I think that's all for me. And uh, without further ado, I'd love to hand over to uh, Prof Redding to lead off with the first lecture. Over to you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thanks for the generous introduction there. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, looks great. Thank you. thank you very much. So thank you very much to Brad IGC for the invitation to participate in this series of lectures on urban economics with Nick Sivanides. Um, today's lecture is going to build on uh, several of the earlier lectures in terms of themes that have already been raised by previous speakers. As Vicky mentioned, the focus today is going to be on modeling uh, internal city structure um, and why that can be insightful for thinking about public policy evaluation. So developing models of, of city structure and show we, how we can use those models to answer policy relevant questions like what will be the effect on city structure if we build a new subway line or a new bus rapid transit system. My half of the lecture, first uh, 30 minutes, is going to be focused on thinking about cities where there's a single type of worker, and the question we're interested in is where is employment located in the city, where are residents located in the city, what is the distribution of land prices within the city. And then in the second half of the lecture, Nick is going to speak about a variety of topics, but in particular is going to look at models where there are multiple types of workers. So there might be high income, low income, uh, high skill, low skill. And in those settings with multiple types of workers, you can think about distributional uh, effects of policies across those different types of workers. Uh, my presentation today is actually going to draw quite closely uh, on a handbook chapter that's just coming out as an MBR working paper uh, next week. Uh, it's currently posted on my web page and it's included uh, on the reading list for anyone who wants to sort of dive into a bit more detail about the material uh, I'm going to cover today. So just to dive in and set the background, um, the complexity of modeling spatial interactions between agents in, in geographical space uh, meant that the theoretical literature on modeling cities traditionally focused on very stylized settings. So in particular, uh, models of a so-called monocentric city where all employment in the city is concentrated at a single point in the center of the city or models where we assume that all locations within the city are symmetric or identical in terms of their fundamental characteristics. And obviously, when we look at real world cities, they don't look like that. They're not perfectly symmetric. They differ in terms of access to the coast, access to rivers, running water and so on. And so that meant that these abstract theoretical models were often quite difficult to connect directly with the data on, on real world cities. 
in the last 10 years or so, there's been a, a bit of a revolution in terms of the development of so-called quantitative urban models. And what's distinctive about these models is that they're built to capture first order features of the data on real world cities. So in particular, many different locations within the city. So many census blocks, census tracts on which one might have data and uh, allowing for those many locations to be asymmetric from one another, to be heterogeneous. So each census tract might differ in terms of its productivity, in terms of its amenities, access to parks, scenic views, and so on, and in terms of its access to the transport network. And, and that means that we can actually take these models to real world data on the city, uh, and we can set the model up so that it rationalizes uh, the observed distribution of employment, residents, and land prices in initial equilibrium in the data. And then we can think about what would be the counterfactual effect of a, of a public policy on that observed distribution of activity. What will happen if I build a new subway between Hudson's Yard and uh, the Bronx? How will economic activity reallocate? Another feature of those models is typically they have a relatively small number of structural parameters to estimate, sort of different from the old computable general equilibrium literature where you know, often one might have, say, 100 parameters, very hard to estimate them credibly. Uh, because these quantitative models have relatively few parameters, you've, there's some hope of finding exogenous sources of variation to try to identify those parameters. And then I mentioned, although, although these models connect with real world data, they're still fairly tractable. And so one can establish theoretical properties of the model and one can use it to undertake sort of transparent policy counterfactuals, like what will happen if I, I build a new, new subway line. So the lecture today, and I guess the whole series of lectures, are really going to be focused on models of cities, so quantitative urban models. Uh, and that means the focus is on internal city structure. So thinking about the organization of employment, residence, and land values within a single city. Just to set this lecture series in its broader context, there's obviously a wider literature on spatial models, where one's interested not only in the distribution of activity within a city, but how a system of different cities interact with one another or how a system of regions interact uh, with one another. Um, and, you know, I've also got some writings on that broader literature, as, as has Nick. Uh, but today we're going to be focused on internal city structure. And, and when one moves from a system of cities to focus on economic activity within a city, one has to sort of think about some different margins. Uh, in particular, when you look within cities, commuting becomes really important. You know, if you're explaining trade and interactions between provinces or states, so there's not that much commuting between state boundaries, but obviously if you're looking at census tracts within cities, there's huge volumes of commuting across those census tracts. And also within cities, the places where you consume differ quite a lot from the places where you live. And so those margins become much more relevant within cities. So I don't have much time today, but I'll just try to briefly set the background with the traditional theory literature then try to give some kind of an overview of what these quantitative urban models look like, and then focus on some applications and conclude. So as I mentioned, the traditional theoretical approach focused on very stylized settings. So there's a so-called Alonzo Muth Mills monocentric city, where all employment is concentrated in a central business district, and then workers live at different distances from that central business district. And because commuting costs increase uh, in the distance away from the central business district, that means that in equilibrium, in order for workers to be indifferent across locations, the higher commuting costs further from the central business district have to be offset by lower land prices. And so the key prediction of the monocentric city is there's a land rent gradient with higher land rents in the center and lower land rents in the suburbs. Obviously, that's a very extreme assumption that all employment's concentrated at a point in the central business district. And so, you know, important contribution in the earlier theory literature was to move away from the monocentric city and develop so-called non-monocentric models where one solves endogenously for the location of both employment and residence within the city. And so employment and residence can locate anywhere within the city. And what's the key sort of trade-off highlighted by those non-monocentric models? Well, if you generate a non-monocentric pattern of economic activity, and here's an example here for a symmetric circular city, where you have a business district followed by a residential, then a business, then mixed use, then a business, then residential. Well, the sort of key trade-off those models highlight is, is when you take some employment out of the center and you disperse it within the city, that's gonna reduce commuting costs. And that's the advantage of the non-monocentric structure. 
Uh, what's the trade-off? Well, the disadvantage is you're dispersing employment through the city, and so you're going to lower agglomeration economies if you think that productivity is increasing in the dens density of employment. And so that was the main insight of those earlier theoretical literatures, uh, theoretical models on non-monocentric cities. But obviously, both these models are very, very stylized, real-world cities. They don't look like a perfectly symmetric circle or, or a, you know, a linear a line in, uh, along the real line. And so what we're interested in today is trying to develop quantitative urban models that go directly to data. And so I'm going to review uh, one, one model uh, kind of that builds on that traditional theory literature and then tries to develop a, a pretty tractable version of it. And that's the paper by uh, Gabriel Alfeld, Daniel Sturm, Nicholas Wolf, and myself in 20, 2015 on, on the reading list. So what's going to be the goal of this model? Well, we're going to imagine that we have data on thousands of city blocks. What do we see in the data? We see employment by workplace for each city block. So that's the number of people who are employed at a facility in that particular city block. Uh, we also see employment by residents for every city block. So that's the number of people who reside, who live in, in a city block and are employed somewhere in the city, anywhere in the city, but they're employed somewhere. So employment by workplace, employment by residents. And we see uh, land rents for every city block. And they're going to be the sort of three pieces, pieces of data. Uh, and we want the model to rationalize that observed data and be available to, to do policy experiments or counterfactuals. So, so that's what I'm going to assume one observes in the data. Of course, sometimes you, you, you see a little bit more than employment by residents and uh, employment by workplace. You may actually see the full matrix of bilateral commuting flows. So for every workplace residence pair, how many people commute from the residents uh, to work in, in the workplace. And you know that these models also work if you see that full bilateral matrix. So in order for the model to match the data, we, we want to allow for the fact that these census blocks may differ from one another in terms of their productivities, their amenities, their supply of floor space. So you know how tall the buildings are relative to land area. And in terms of uh, the transport network, bilateral travel time between these locations as determined by you know, the underground line, observed uh, street railways and uh, road traffic. And we also want the model to allow for agglomeration forces. So there might be production externalities, the denser employment in, in, in an area, the higher productivity, or there could also be residential externalities. Um, so they're gonna be the forces for agglomeration, and then there are gonna be some uh, forces for dispersion, some congestion costs, which will be an inelastic supply of floor space uh, and commuting costs. So it's costly to separate your residence and your workplace. And so the key question in these quantitative urban models is how important are the differences in exogenous productivity and amenities across locations, the differences in fundamentals, access to water, scenic views, and so on, and how important are the agglomeration economies, the endogenous forces for the concentration of economic activity. And that's going to be really important for, for the policy counterfactuals. And so we want a way of being able to structurally estimate the parameters of the model, answer that question, how important are the agglomeration forces relative to the exogenous differences across locations. And then once we've answered that question, we can then use the model to do our policy counterfactuals. So a little bit more detail on how the model works and why it's tractable, how, why it's easy to take to the data. We're going to think about we uh, have a worker, Psy, who uh, is, might be from some occupation. But as I mentioned, I'm going to abstract from multiple occupations, occupations here. So we're just going to drop that occupation O. And, and this worker lives in residence N and is employed in workplace I. And what's her utility function? Well, here I've got her indirect utility function. It depends upon the wage she receives where she works in I. Her cost of living in her residence in N, that's the price of consumption goods, P, and the price of residential floor space, Q. And then her utility is also going to depend upon how nice the amenities are in her residence N, um, how big the commuting costs are, kappa, in commuting from her residence N to her workplace in I. And then the key thing that's going to keep the model tractable is we're going to imagine that this uh, worker draws a matrix of idiosyncratic preference shocks, little b and i, which is an idiosyncratic shock to how much this worker um, uh, derives a utility from living in residence N and working in workplace I. Okay, And uh, that's going to make the whole model tractable by keeping everything smooth and delivering a gravity equation for commuting flows. 
These commuting costs are increasing in the travel time, tau ni, between the residents and the workplace. Whereas I mentioned, we can take into account real world transport networks. And then typically we're going to assume that these idiosyncratic preferences are drawn from an extreme value distribution here. Um, so the parameter epsilon here is gonna govern the dispersion in idiosyncratic preferences. So the lower epsilon, the more dispersion there is. Uh, and and you know, uh, the higher epsilon, the, the less dispersion there is. And in the limit as epsilon goes to infinity, workers are only gonna care about um, economic characteristics. There are gonna be no idiosyncratic preferences. And then how about these amenities uh, where you live in residence N? Well, they depend, as I mentioned, on fundamental things, B bar. So this is things like there's a park there, there's a scenic view and um, residential externalities, this blackboard bold B, uh, which depends on the travel time weighted surrounding concentration of residents. So that's the sort of uh, residential side of the model. And if we assume that those idiosyncratic preferences have an extreme value distribution, we get this nice, very simple expression at the top of the slide here. What is the probability that any individual worker chooses to live in residence N and work in workplace I? And for simplicity in the model, we're going to think about there being a continuous mass of workers. So there's not going to be any uh, uncertainty in the supply of workers to any workplace because there's a continuous measure of workers. And we're going to you know, uh, apply the law of large numbers across that continuum. And so we get these sort of nice deterministic predictions for uh, these bilateral probabilities that someone lives in N and works in I. And they take a very intuitive form. What does this bilateral commuting flow depend on? Well, very intuitively, it depends on the wage at the workplace, the amenities at the residence, cost of consumption goods, cost of floor space at the residence, how costly it is to commute from the residence to the workplace, uh, and then uh, these exogenous amenities at the workplace. And, and importantly, the probability that I commute between N and I doesn't just depend upon those workplace and residence characteristics for N and I, but it also depends on their relative value compared to any other pair of workplace K, sorry, workplace L and residence K. Okay, so in other words, we get a structural gravity equation for commuting between residence N and workplace I, which depends not only on bilateral commuting costs, but also commuting costs for all other pairs. And that was the key breakthrough in these quantitative urban models. That's what keeps them tractable is this very simple gravity equation prediction. Why? because it means every location faces this upward sloping supply function for commuters. If I want to attract more people to uh, my workplace, I, I need to increase the wage in a smooth way, and then I'm gonna get generate this upward sloping supply of, of commuters. Another nice feature of this extreme value distribution is that expected utility conditional on choosing a particular resonance workplace pair is equalized across all resonance workplace pairs within the city. And so some quantitative urban models will assume what's called an open city, uh, where there's some outside option of living in the wider economy. And the measure of workers who choose to uh, live in the city as a whole is gonna be determined by an indifference condition with that reservation level of utility in the wider economy. That's called an open city. Other specifications will, will consider what's called a closed city, where we think about the city as just having an exogenous total number of workers. Uh, and those two cases will be important for the effect of policy interventions because obviously in a closed city with a fixed number of workers, if you build a new subway line, that can potentially affect worker utility as well as land values. Whereas if you're in an open city where workers have this outside option of living in the wider economy, then if you build a new subway line in the city, utility will stay unchanged because workers always have this constant outside option, but you'll change the total population of the city and uh, the, the real income of landlords. Okay. So on the production side of the model, what does that look like? Well, we're going to have a fairly standard constant returns to scale production technology that uses labor with wage uh, W and commercial floor space with price little q. And this is the cost function here. So the cost of production depends upon wages and the price of commercial floor space. And capital A here is the productivity in a particular location. Uh, the, we're going to assume there's a single uh, final good that's uh, costlessly traded within the city and choose that as our numeraire. And so that price of the final good is equal to one. And this is the zero profit condition for the good to be produced. That price of one has to equal a unit cost of one. Productivity is also going to have some exogenous components, A bar, 
which might be access to natural water, the uh, topography of the ground. And then in addition, there are going to be some endogenous agglomeration forces, this blackbird bold A here, which depend upon the travel time-weighted sum of surrounding employment. And then obviously the background, we're also gonna have a floor space market clearing condition that the demand for residential floor space has to equal the supply of uh, residential floor space. The demand for commercial floor space has to equal the supply of commercial floor space. And in the version of the model in these slides, we're gonna think about there being an exogenous supply of both residential and commercial floor space determined by zoning regulations. But again, there are versions of these models that allow for endogenous allocation of floor space between commercial and residential use, and there being a no arbitrage condition between those two uses. And there are also versions that allow for an endogenous supply of floor space so that as uh, land prices rise, you build taller buildings. And both of those can be handled very, very easily. As I mentioned, what's uh, an attractive feature of these quantitative urban models is because they allow for all these differences in fundamentals, they match the observed data on cities and, and are suitable platforms for counterfactuals. But another nice feature of them is that they stay fairly tractable. And in the limited time, I'm just briefly going to mention that you can show that you can write the uh, system of equilibrium uh, endogenous variables in the model in, in the form of, a, of a, a set of equations represented at the bottom of this slide where on the left side of each equation, you have an endogenous variable raised to some power. And then on the right-hand side of that equation, you have uh, lots of endogenous variables raised to constant elasticities. And then there's some weighting factor on those endogenous variables, which in the model here is bilateral travel time, travel time from location N to any other location I. And when you can write the system of equations in that form, you can derive conditions on these elasticities, uh, the powers on the endogenous variables under which the equilibrium of the model is unique. Uh, and so you know what region of the parameter space will there be a unique equilibrium and what region of the parameter space will there be multiple equilibria. And so you really have a sense analytically of how these models behave. So let me dive into the applications. I'm going to do two applications. I'll mention in a bit more detail that paper by Alfalt et al. That, that I took, took the model from. And in that model, we use the exogenous division of Berlin uh, after the end of the Second World War for geopolitical reasons and its reunification uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain as an exogenous shot to estimate the strength of agglomeration and dispersion forces. And as I said, once you know those parameters, you can then do counterfactuals. And then I'll also briefly mention a second application where we show how you can use these models to evaluate transport improvements. And in our case, again, we look at a natural experiment. We look at the invention of the steam passenger railway, and we see how it changed the organization of economic activity within London. So starting with Berlin. So this is just an illustration of what the type of data these models can cope with. So this is the distribution of land prices in, in Berlin in 1936 before the Second World War normalized so there's a mean land price of one, and I'll keep that mean constant in all subsequent figures. And you can see uh, the highest land prices were in the very center of the city in an area Mitte that became part of East Berlin. Uh, but then there's a pretty complicated pattern of concentric rings of uh, progressively lower land prices around that central area. And so the monocentric city model would only be an approximation. There's a much richer distribution of land rents within the city that we want, want the model to explain. In order to think about what division is going to do, I'm now going to show you that 36 distribution of land prices again, but only for the parts of the city that ended up being in West Berlin. And you can see that there were two areas of the pre-war city that had high land prices that were part of West Berlin. There's this area here just west of the future line of the Berlin Wall, uh, and there's an area further west that was an area called the Kurfürsten Dam. And so what the division of Berlin is going to do is it's going to cut off the city from its pre-war CBD. And in particular, this area of high land prices is going to lose access to nearby locations that before the war had extremely high land prices with very high concentrations of employment and residents, and hence very strong agglomeration forces. So now I'm going to show you that same uh, land price distribution in 1986. And you can see that with the division of the city, one of those areas of high land prices is entirely eliminated. So as that area loses access to nearby concentrations of employment and residents, uh, it ceases to be a high uh, land price area, ceases to be an important area of concentration of employment and residents. 
We find very little impact of the Berlin Wall uh, elsewhere in the city, uh, but it's really the areas where you lose access to nearby concentrations of employment and residents that we see big uh, effects. Now let's roll forward and look at Berlin in 2006. And you can see that the um, pre-war central business district just east of the what used to be the Berlin Wall emerges as a high land price area. And you start again to see high land prices in that part of West Berlin that's just west of the pre-war central business district. And you see that even more clearly if I just show you the part of Berlin that uh, was in the former West Berlin in, in 2006. And you can see that re-emergence of this part of the city uh, just, e just west of the former Berlin Wall, uh, as it gains access to a central business district again, it starts to become an important concentration of employment and residents and starts to have high land prices. So I only have a, you know, about a few minutes left. So let me just sort of briefly now mention that what the paper does is we use that exogenous shock to estimate the strength of agglomeration forces in the model. What do we find? Well, we find two important findings. First parameter we estimate is this parameter lambda, which is the elasticity of productivity to employment density. Existing research uh, looking across cities suggests that that tends to be between uh, three and 7%. Uh, we get 7% using this exogenous shock. So we're kind of uh, roughly in the ballpark in terms of the strength of agglomeration forces in production. One uh, new insight is for the model to match the data, we also need to introduce agglomeration forces in residential decisions. And we need a pretty high elasticity there, about 15% or 0.15. Uh, and a bunch of recent papers have sort of confirmed that importance of agglomeration forces in residents. So that's the kind of first new finding. Uh, we find agglomeration forces in residents. And then the second new finding is that both of those agglomeration forces decay very rapidly in travel time. So after about 10 minutes of travel time, we find that production agglomeration forces decline to close to zero, as do uh, residential agglomeration forces. 10 minutes of travel time is about uh, 0.83 uh, kilometers uh, walking or around four kilometers traveling by underground railway line. So it just kind of highlights that for the model to match the data, you need strong agglomeration forces and they have to be extremely localized. And then in my last couple of minutes, let me show you how these models, once you've estimated the strength of agglomeration forces, can be used to look at the impact of, of transport improvements. So we look at the construction of a 19th century London's railway network. What's nice about this setting is in the era before the railway, most people lived close to where they worked. Why? Because the only commuting modes were walking and horses, and horses are pretty expensive. And so most people just walk to work. Um, uh, of a speed of around three miles an hour. When the first railway passenger railways, steam railways were invented, first one uh, in the world was constructed in London in 1836. Uh, average travel speeds jumped to around 21 miles an hour and it becomes possible to separate where you live and where you work. In the data, you see quite a big reorganization of activity in London around that time. So this shows you the on the right panel, this is the population of the London metropolitan area expressed as an index that's one in 1801. And you see by 1921, the metro area population increases by a factor of six, 600% growth. London goes from around a million to close to six million. In contrast, if you look at residential population in the uh, commercial heart of, of the metro area, which confusingly is called the city of London, but it means the one mile center uh, of the city, roughly the old Roman heart of the city, that falls by around 90% after the invention of the steam railway. What's going on there? Well, at the same time as residential population in the commercial center falls by 90%, there's a sharp increase in employment by workplace. Why? Because once you can travel by railway at 21 miles an hour, it's easier for the center of the city to specialize as a workplace because it's relatively productive and people can now move in the suburbs and enjoy nicer amenities and more space the suburbs have a comparative advantage as residents, whereas the center has a comparative advantage as a workplace. Uh, and one of the things we do in the paper is we show that when we um, you know, use the quantitative model with uh, you know, estimated values of agglomeration forces similar to those in the Berlin paper, the model can actually do quite a good job in replicating this uh, separation of workplace uh, and uh, employment by workplace and employment by residents. So the dashed black line of the model's predictions compared with the data in the solid black line. 
uh, and we show the model to we use the model to show that you can rationalize the construction of London's 19th century railway network in the sense that their net present value of the increase in, in the value of land and buildings from the railway network is greater than uh, historical estimates of the railway's construction costs. And so that's just an illustration of how you can use these types of models to evaluate transport improvements. So I'm basically out of time. Uh, just in my concluding slide, I just wanted to flag that uh, this is an area where it, you know it's certainly not true that everything's been done. There are just so many areas of new, exciting things that remain to be done. Uh, really exciting area. Dynamics, uh, develop, the model I developed, static. Uh, thinking about dynamic urban models is really exciting area. Heterogeneous urban models that Nick's going to talk about is really exciting. Optimal transport investments, also a lot of exciting work going on there. Um, you know, Not only is this an area where there are lots of exciting questions, it's also an area where there's just an explosion of data within cities that contains geographic information, uh, GPS type data, ride hailing smartphones, credit card data, barcode scanner data, satellite imaging data. And so this is just a really exciting area where we have both new theory and new data to think about the organization of activity within cities. Uh, although in my applications, I concept, con uh, concentrated on developed cities, it's particularly exciting in developing countries where this, this new data is really opening up uh, a window on cities in contexts where sometimes we don't have official census data, but we have these new sources of data. And so I look forward to seeing all the exciting research that many of you uh, on, the, on the call today are going to be engaged in in the coming years. And, and I should stop there. Sorry, I ran over by a minute or so and hand over to, to Nick. Great. Vicky, I, I take it I just go straight in? Yes, please do. Lovely. And can you see my slides and can you see my mouse? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, okay, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Steve, and um, to to Vicky for the invitation and and just the the IGC and Bread for hosting this series. I think it's um, it's really great. And I wanted to start off, you know, so the this lecture is a lecture primarily to PhD students. So I'm going to teach one of the, you know, as if you were a PhD students in my class. I'm going to go through an abridged version uh, of of one of my classes. Um, but I did want to say at the beginning, it's great to see uh, you in the chat coming from a wide range of uh, countries across Asia, Africa. Um, so it's really great to see an interest um, in these kind of topics uh, from, from all of these regions. I think we need much more research, uh, especially I'm myself interested in research in low and middle income countries. We need much more research is coming from those countries. Uh, and a common thread that was in some of these questions was, you know, Steve is, is telling us about Germany, he's telling us about London, are these kind of models applicable to uh, lower middle income country settings where maybe we lack the same type of data, where maybe some of the institutions are a bit different. Um, and so I would just, before I go into the, the meat of one of my papers, I just want to say, you know, to be optimistic about that. Uh, I'm working in that area, lots of other people are working in that area. It's very exciting. Um, it's the policy questions are huge because there's going to be so many people moving into cities in these areas. Um, and in terms of data, you know, you typically use data from population uh, censuses, maybe property assessments uh, or establishment censuses. I think we may have lost Nick on his connection. Um, Greg, can you confirm that you can hear me and it's not my connection? Yeah, unfortunately, I think he's he's dropped off, so we might just have to take a minute for him to rejoin. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. We just might need a minute or two. Uh, Nick is actually in, uh, I believe, Freetown, Sierra Leone at the moment. Um, looking at doing some really exciting uh, research there using these models. Um, maybe he can also tell us more about that when he rejoins, but we could just take uh, a minute or two and wait for his connection to restart. Great, I think you're back, Nick. Yeah, yes, we yeah. Progress. Yes. Hold on. 
Okay, I'm here. Uh, sorry, everyone. Okay, so let me... Let me just get up my slides. Okay. Okay. There we go, sorry. Okay, can you see this now, Vicky? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so let me let me get into it. So Steve um told us, uh, gave us a kind of overview of how these models can be used to think about cities. Uh, and he gave us a couple of examples of uh, models including one group of uh, one type of worker um, thinking about uh, measuring uh, agglomeration externalities in the context of uh, 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 Germany and then um, in the context of looking at the effects of transport uh, in London. Okay so today I'm going to talk um, about transit infrastructure and in particular with an interest as Steve mentioned about how the incidence of improving transport infrastructure may differ across different types of, of workers. So meaning how, how it may benefit the rich uh, and poor uh, differentially. Okay, so uh, as Steve mentioned, these kind of this kind of class of models are very well set up to actually study uh, policies quantitatively. Okay, so to actually feed in a policy into a model that fits, fits real world data and to spit out numbers about how that policy affects outcomes like welfare of residents, uh, GDP of the city, the gradient of land prices across uh, um, uh, across places. Okay, and so I'm going to focus today on uh, my paper on the impact of bus rapid transit in Bogota. Um, I've suggested some additional reading, uh, which is on the reading list uh, of a paper of Alan and Arkalakis, who give a very elegant way to extend some of this kind of discrete choice architecture that Steve and I are talking about in this lecture. Uh, to think about routing uh, decisions. And that kind of opens up the way that we can think about um, uh, the impacts of transport uh, policies. So in particular, it allows us to answer the question of if I uh, build a new road or a new highway between locations A and B, how does that affect uh, transit times and the distribution of economic activity across all other locations in the city? given that I may use the road between A and B, even if I live in location C, perhaps I'm, I'm trying to work at uh, location B or I'm trying to go to some uh, third location. Okay, but in today's uh, lecture, we're just gonna focus on this paper. Okay, so as I was saying uh, at the beginning, I think this is a really, uh, so the one, one question that I'm gonna be interested in here is what are the aggregate effects of improving urban transit? So that means what is the overall return that uh, cities get if they invest a dollar uh, in, in improving urban transit infrastructure. And as I was saying at the beginning, I think this is a really first order question for uh, uh, low and middle income country cities, uh, because over the next decades, uh, billions of people are gonna move into these, uh, these cities. Okay, so this mass urban migration is gonna take place not in Europe and in, in the US, but countries across Asia and Africa. And as they do that, they're going to become a lot more congested. And this congestion is going to uh, produce a drag on the development potential and opportunities that cities give us to um, you know, lead to more uh, prosperity uh, to do with the agglomeration and all of the potential benefits that concentration can give. OK, so that's the first question I'm interested in uh, in this in this paper. And the second one is how these effects are distributed across different types of workers in the city. Okay, so if if when I when I started this project, looking in 
the data in Bogota in 1995, uh, poor, low-skilled workers were around 25% more likely to commute to work using informal minibuses. And when I looked in the data, they actually have data on the speeds of these trips as well. And I found that these uh, informal minibuses are around 30% slower uh, than cars. They they stop a lot along the route, kind of waiting and um, uh, and waiting for pa passengers and dropping off passengers and so on. Okay, so not only do the the poor use public transit um, more than the uh, than the rich, but that public transit tends to be slower. Okay, so we might think that improving public transit might be a kind of pro poor policy that ends up benefiting uh, the poor the most. Okay, so these are the broad questions that I'm interested in. And then um, to look at these, I kind of used uh, Bogota, Colombia as a case study uh, and studied the impact of the construction of a, a bus rapid transit system called Transmillennio. Uh, Transmillennio is the world's most used bus rapid transit system in terms of uh, passengers per day. And this was opened across three phases uh, during the 2000s. Okay, and as you can see from this picture on the, on the right, it's not a typical bus system. It operates essentially much more similar to, to a subway. Okay, so these, these buses are kind of bi or tri articulated, meaning they're two or three vehicles joined together. They operate on dedicated lanes where they're, they're free from uh, uh, traffic on the main road. They have dual lanes allowing for local and express services. And when a station gets congested, buses can be diverted to, to, to keep um, them flowing through the system. And then you have these kind of stations um that look you know operate in the same way as a, a, a subway station would work so you have a smart you have a card you swipe the card when you enter this station to pay and then you don't have to pay when you actually board the bus the doors just open you board the bus okay and all of that um comes together to, to mean that in the data this has a similar seat speed uh, to subways uh, but of course, the the reason why we don't see subways popping around, uh, popping up everywhere, especially uh, in the emerging world, is that they're very expensive and they're very long to build. Uh, very the the planning uh, time to build them is very long. BRT is uh, kind of the opposite in both of those regards. It's very fast to build. So this system went from being an idea proposed by the mayor to actually opening uh, in less than three in the, in around eighteen months, um, and they're a lot cheaper to build. Uh, so this system was around 10% of the cost uh, per kilometer as the uh, subway or the, the train system in Medellin, which is Colombia's uh, second city. And so because of these features, it's currently being built uh, across many uh, developing country cities. And what was nice about this context in uh, Colombia is this was a setting where this had already been built uh, during the 2000s. And this was a period and a, a setting in Colombia where they had very rich granular uh, census tract level data, which I could uh, combine to look at how the sit economic activity in the city uh, re you know reorganized before and after the system was built. Okay, given the time, I'm going to go over quite uh, uh, briefly over this, so 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 I can get into just showing you it. So, the approach of this paper is going to be threefold. So first, it's going to develop a, a quantitative general equilibrium model of a city, similar to what we saw in, in Steve's lecture. The key new features is there's going to be different types of workers, so low and high uh, educated workers. You can think of them loosely as being rich and poor. And there's going to be multiple modes of transport. In the second part of the paper, I'm going to show that this class of models gives a new way to think about and measure treatment effects from uh, transport uh, infrastructure. Okay, so typically, one if one would em uh, empirically analyze the effect of a transit system, one looks at how outcomes like house prices or population change in different distance bands away from stations. Okay, now I'm going to show you that this theory gives you something very different, but still gives you a, a regression. So it's 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 still uh, fairly simple to to, to estimate. What's nice about this, uh, this approach is these regression coefficients end up being sufficient statistics. What does that mean? It means that if I know the change in these accessibility terms, so these are, these are these treatment effects, these measures of how a place is affected by a transport infrastructure. If I know that, and I know these regression coefficients, then in a special case of this model, that's all I need to know to tell you a number of interesting things about the in, uh, the effect of uh, infrastructure. It won't tell you the overall effect on GDP, 
but it's going to tell you relative changes in economic activity across space. And we'll see that uh, in a moment. OK, and then the third part of the paper is going to be to estimate the model and to quantify the effect of the BRT. And one of the key aims here is going to be to compare what you get from one of these models with what you get uh, using the typical approach that institutions like the World Bank use to evaluate the effects of transport infrastructure, which is on the value of travel time savings. OK, so you look, you look at a proposed infrastructure, you, you try to measure, given how people currently travel, how many minutes are going to be saved given that infrastructure. And then you add all those up and then you multiply it by a value of time. We're going to see there's a very tight connection between that and uh, and the model, uh, which I show you. And, uh, and let's just get into it so I can so I can show you. OK, so first we're going to start with this first part, which will be setting up the model before we take a simplified version of it and, and take it to the data. And I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel here. It's, I'm going to take the model that uh, that Steve presented, uh, used to uh, uh, think about, um, to study the effects of the Berlin Wall, and I'm going to extend it to include some heterogeneity. So there will be uh, different types of workers, different types of industries, and there's going to be different types of transit. Okay, and loose, the key distinction here is going to be that there will be cars, which is an, an expensive mode of transport. And then there's going to be other modes of transport which are freely available to everybody. Okay, so cars you're going to have to pay for, other modes of transport are going to be free. Okay, obviously that's going to be a um, simplification. These models are not aiming to describe every single aspect of the world. We're trying to pick the minimum toolkit necessary to answer our question uh, precisely. Given what I saw in the data was really just that the it was the car use varied a lot by income and car speed versus uh, transit speed uh, varied a lot. That that was the margin that I wanted to focus on. So in the model, there are many locations which will be indexed by I. Uh, they differ in some exogenous characteristics, such as uh, their amenities and productivities, uh, the time it takes them to commute to other locations, and the total amount of housing. There are two types of workers, as I mentioned. They'll be indexed by G. Uh, and they make three choices over where to live, uh, where to work, and whether or not to own a car. And then the production side of the model, I'm going to be gloss over quite uh, quickly. The details are in the in the paper, but it's kind of fairly fairly simple. So there's going to be a representative firm in each location from each of these different industries, and they use both types of labor to uh, to produce their output. So they use low and high skill but they may use them in different um, intensities. So you may have high skill intensive industries like consulting, financial services, real estate. They need a lot of high skill workers, low skill intensive industries like um, retail, uh, construction. They, they demand relatively more low skill uh, 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 workers. Okay, there'll be landowners in the model that allocate uh, floor space between residential and commercial use to maximize their profits. And this is going to be an equilibrium model. So prices, which will be wages, and floor space prices adjust uh, to clear markets. The worker side of the model is fairly similar to what we saw with uh, with Steve. So we're just going to have a, a, some extra indices here. So the utility of an individual worker, Omega, who lives in location I and who chooses a car ownership status A, that can be either zero or one. They get some flow utility that depends on amenities. It depends on consumption. It depends on uh, housing consumption, where I use home uh, stone geary preferences. So people have a subsistence housing requirement H bar. What this is going to introduce uh, will be a non homothetisty in demand for amenities, because poor people are going to spend a relatively higher fraction of their income on housing. And so they're going to be a lot more sensitive to housing uh, prices. OK, so they'll be much less willing to pay for high amenities in a neighborhood because they really dislike the fact that the housing prices in equilibrium will be high in high amenity uh, uh, neighborhoods. OK, and I used I included that to, to speak to the sorting and kind of gentrification effects that you can get when uh, a place based policy affects uh, land values. OK, and then as in Steve's work, there's going to be a, an idiosyncratic shock that each worker gets um, that's going to be drawn from an extreme value distribution, uh, which is a, a, a fresh A parameter. 
Okay, the budget constraint is fairly simple. The only thing to note is that there is a uh, a fixed cost of owning a car. So if you own a car, you pre you pay price P A. Um, and so in equilibrium, what's going to happen? It's going to only be richer individuals, the higher ed uh, higher educated individuals, who are willing to pay that uh, that fixed cost of uh, of owning a car. Okay, and then in the model workers, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that you first choose where to live and then choose where to work. And this is relaxed in the appendix. This just makes some of the algebra easier for the main uh, part of the model. Okay, it, here I'm just solving for the supply side of the model. So uh, solving it um, uh, backwards. So conditional on living in location I, working location, sorry, uh, living in I and with car ownership status A. You choose where to work to maximize this expression, which is your income net of commuting costs. And this uh, this gets you exactly the same expressions for uh, commuting flows as Steve had in his model, where the probability that if I live in I, that I commute to location J, it depends on my net wage that I get from uh, working there, because I care not only about my nominal wage, but I also care about the commute cost to get there relative to all other locations that I have available to me from my uh, from my location. Okay, so this is in the denomin uh, denom uh, denominator here. And this denominator term I call resident commuter market access. It's going to crop up in a couple of slides. It reflects access to well-paid jobs. Okay, so you can see here that this phi r term is going to be high when you're close in terms of having low Ds, low commute costs, to places with high wages. Okay, and then in the first stage, people are gonna choose where to live and whether to own a car, taking expectation over this job search process that happens in the second stage. When you solve this, you get a similar expression, um, similar parametric form, in that the number of people who choose to live in location I with car ownership A, this depends on the common part of the utility of making that choice which depends on amenities, house prices, and expected income, to some elasticity, okay? So to this parameter eta, and in both of these expressions, the this theta and this eta uh, reflect the um, dispersion of these idiosyncratic draws, okay? So this idiosyncratic preference for residential locations, when those things are very dispersed, eta is low, and so choices aren't too sensitive to how attractive a particular place is, because all that matters is your idiosyncratic valuation of that place. And same thing for, uh, for theta. Okay, the rest of the model is closed pretty simply. So with the, given that we only have uh, uh, seven minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna proceed. So that was stage one uh, of, the, of the approach. Okay, so that's setting up a model very similar to Steve's, just extending it in a couple of margins to capture some of the features that are needed to answer the questions that I'm interested in. So mainly including multiple worker groups and multiple work uh, forms of transport where there's some non-homothetisty in transport demand, meaning that demand for transport depends on income. In my case, it depends on, it, that works through this fix, through this fixed cost. Now to take the model to the data, um, I want to consider a special case of the model because it's gonna turn out that we get some very simple regressions that come out of the model that we can then run in the data in a very simple form, right? We can do OLS, we can do linear IV, we can do all the usual things we would do in reduced form, but just in a way that's in informed by the theory. Okay, so uh, specifically, I'm basically going to assume away the, the heterogeneity that I just discussed. So we're gonna go back to Steve's model. So there's gonna be one group of workers, no fixed elements of expenditure or income, and there's gonna be an exogenous share of floor space allocated to residential and commercial use. Okay. In this model, you find that a uh, residential commuter market access, this accessibility term, increases the supply of residents who want to live in a particular location. There's a similar notion for firms, okay? So when you write down what's the supply of workers to a particular location J, it depends on the wage, the nominal wage that, that firms uh, offer there, but it also depends on this accessibility term, okay? So this accessibility term, which we solve for below, shifts the labor supply curve, okay? So it says that if you take two places that both offer 
five dollars an hour wages one of them is really really remote and really far from where workers live one of them is is right uh you know in, in a very well located area that only takes people can walk there it's going to be that second location that ends up attracting lots of workers okay because people again care not just about nominal wage they care about wage net of uh, commute costs okay given um data on where people live and where people work and these commute costs it can be shown that these terms are, are the unique solution to scale so in relative terms the following system of equations okay so what that means is you don't actually need a huge amount of data to recover these terms so these these this sort of data you can get from population or establishment censuses um or maybe cell phone data and the commute costs you can get through google maps or or arcgis let me show you what these uh, uh, look like. So this is what you would typically do in a reduced form approach. You would compare places in red, which are close to these transmillennial lines with places in blue that are uh, further away. You might do a more nuanced version of this with distance bands, but still it's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's kind of on or off. Here I'm showing you the percentage change in a residential commuter market access, where red is a very large change in commuter market access, access of workers to jobs. Blue is where it increases not, uh, not so much. And here you can just see, first off, it captures a very large heterogeneity in this across the, the city. So in Bogota, the highest density of jobs are in the center, in the center north. And so it's places towards the edge of the city where people had to uh, travel for uh, you know, 90 minutes prior to this infrastructure being built, that's where access to jobs really improves a lot. Okay, if you already live in the CBD, you're probably walking to work and this infrastructure doesn't, doesn't really affect you. Likewise, if you look for firms, so firms commute to market access, remember what was their accessibility to workers, that has a very different pattern. So again, in Bogota, uh, jobs are concentrated in the, in the center, residential densities are much higher in the periphery, especially in the south and the southwest of the city, which are much poorer. And that, that means that it's central and actually a little more towards the north um, parts of the city where firms experience much greater in access to workers, right? All of these workers can now travel into these uh, places. And so it becomes easier for firms to, to access them. Um, now, what's nice about this, uh, this, uh, this simplification is that it turns out you can actually write this model, this simplified version in a log linear form. So you can write the endogenous variables in this model, changes in, in floor space prices and employment in residential uh, populations as log linear functions of these uh, commuter market access terms. Okay, where this is really a reduced form in the sense that these coefficients here are the composite of a direct effect. So when you change market access, how does land price increase uh, directly, but then indirectly, right? Because people are going to change their employment, uh, their, their residence and location choices. There's going to be all these feedback effects that go, that go on through the city. And that's captured through this inverse uh, uh, matrix. Okay. And then what's in these pr parameters is in the, is detailed in the paper. Now these coefficients have a block structure, meaning that res changes in in population and residential population changes in in residential commuter market uh, changes in residential uh, prices property prices depend only on changes in residential commuter market access and vice versa for uh, for firms. Okay, and what this means is you can write uh, this system as two regression. Uh, 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 regression equations. Okay, where residential commuter market residential outcomes depend on residential commuter market access, and and likewise for firms. Okay, and what proposition one says in the paper tells you what you can what you can do with this. So, it says relative changes in economic activity. So how much population changes in each block relative to the overall change across the cities or same for house prices. This can be computed using an estimate for this commuting elasticity theta, as well as these four regression coefficients that we can estimate here, as well as if you have data on the initial distribution of activity and if you have data on the particular change in commute costs. Okay, so why is this attractive? It means that 
uh, you don't actually need to solve this complex model if you're just interested in if I build a, a, a transit line, how's this going to shift relatively house prices across the city, where employment is, where people live and so on. You actually don't need to solve this whole complicated model. You only need these inputs and these coefficients that you estimate. Okay, if you then want to know actually the level of changes, so like the, whether uh, GDP or house prices overall go up, and how overall people benefit in the city, so the change in utility, you do need to know two extra things. One is an assumption on population mobility between that, that city and the rest of the country, and you need values uh, for two parameters, uh, the expenditure share on housing and the uh, elasticity of, of demand for, for goods. But these are things that you can typically calibrate and you could always just try alternative values of those. Uh, Vicky, I think I'm out of time, um, so... I can please I can... uh, carry on, Nick. I think you've got five extra minutes given my introduction, so so you're welcome to carry on. Okay. So let me let me the uh, let me with the five extra minutes. What I will do is not tell you about data, but the slides will be posted online and it's described in the paper. I'm not going to tell you about identification, okay? But broadly, typically we worry that where the government certainly doesn't build infrastructure randomly, okay? So if we see house prices going up in areas that the infrastructure was built or where access is going up, they may have been going up anyway. Okay, and so instead of relying on one approach in this paper, I kind of use uh, uh, multiple ones. So one is a uh, IV, others are trying to use placebo effect, uh, checks and falsification and other tips and tricks that you can use uh, using these uh, market access type uh, approaches. Okay, so I won't, um, I won't, I, I won't dwell on that. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, people typically use uh, value of travel time saved to measure welfare effects from transit infrastructure. What's really neat in this class of models is that in under certain conditions, okay, so if you you make assumptions such that the observed such that the equilibrium is efficient, so that means you have to assume away spillovers, and you have to assume away preference heterogeneity, okay. But if you do that, then you find that um, the first order effect on welfare, meaning that if I give uh, of a, to a change in commute costs, okay, meaning that if I give you a very small change in commute costs, the change in overall welfare in the city is proportional to a weighted average of the change in travel times. Okay, and this is basically exactly what people do in the value of travel time saved. So what's nice about this is, first, it connects what that literature is doing with this class of models. But second, it also tells you that there's a, a, a difference, right? So when people build infrastructure, it could be actually that you see travel times go up because now it makes suburban areas that were previously very, very inaccessible. It makes them accessible. People can live there. They can have larger homes, maybe access to better schools. And so you may even see that travel times go up on average, right? So I may have been commuting 30 minutes. Now I move out to the suburbs and I take this train or BRT into the city. I commute 60 minutes. Um, there could be ways other than time that, that welfare effects manifest themselves. So what's nice about this approach is A, it connects those two approaches, but B, it also tells you why they may be different. Okay, so it could be that the, the real world is inefficient. It could also be that in the real world, these shocks are not small, right? So this the way I think of these small shocks is you're kind of holding behavior fixed, right? So your holding is fixed where I live and where I work, and you're just saying, how do I benefit from changing times a little bit? Could be that when you change times a lot, well, now it's it's not reasonable to keep where I live and where I work uh, uh, the same. Okay, so what are the main findings in the last uh, two minutes? So first, I find that the value of travel time savings only gets around 55% of the full equilibrium effects. Okay, so that first tells you that if you're just using the value of time savings to value these approaches, you're underestimating the welfare effects of uh, this uh, this sorts of infrastructure. So that's the main effect, uh, the main answer to the to to to, to that question. I then look at the uh, the effect on inequality, so across uh, different groups. So first, I want you to look at panel B, the first row. So here, I'm using the full model, which I've estimated, but not not given you any any of the details. But I'm assuming away a bunch of the heterogeneity that made that model interesting. So I'm assuming that workers are perfect substitutes in, uh, in, in labor demand. So they get exactly the same wages, they're perfectly substitutes in the IF firms. 
and they have the same values of these commuting and residential choice elasticities. Okay, in that model, you get that this uh, BRT benefits the low skill the most and inequality falls by around 0.4%. Okay, so this is welfare inequality on average across the city. So what I wanna do is go from that simplification to what I actually estimate. Okay, so in the second row, I allow for different commuting elasticities. In the model, what I find is that low skill workers are much more elastic in terms of their commuting decisions than high skill workers. Okay, so this benefits the high skill workers and means that now inequality only falls by around half. Okay, so now it falls by around 0.16%. Uh, what is the idea behind this? So the idea here is that you see this time and again in different contexts, low skilled uh, workers much more elastic in commuting uh, in their commuting decisions. What you should have in mind is perhaps a cleaner or a security guard. Their wage is going to be pretty similar in different parts of the city. Okay, so if you make one part more uh, accessible or not, um, you're going to really change a lot uh, their, their commuting behavior. High skill workers, you see a lot more idiosyncratic variation in wages. Okay, so it might be that I find a position at, at Goldman Sachs or a consulting firm where the, the person really likes me and they offer me a really, really high wage uh, compared to my, to, to my other options. And so that would generate a kind of stickiness in travel choices in the data. And then uh, what that means is that in a world with low transport uh, costs, with high transport costs, it's actually the high skill workers that bear those costs the most because they're not able to substitute away to other alternatives when, a, when a, a cost on a particular pair is very high. Low skill workers, on the other hand, they're, they're easily able to substitute to, to other options. OK, so that uh, that operates in, in favor of the low skill. Finally, the, the thing which gets the final result is then allowing workers to be imperfect substitutes in labor. And this actually flips the result. And it now, uh, the, the system benefits the high skill the most. So inequality rises by around 0.5%. And what's happening here is now workers are imperfect substitutes in production. And so this transport infrastructure, so in when they're perfect substitutes in production, when low skill workers uh, start commuting to the CBD where high skill workers work, high skill workers are hurt because all of that uh, competition in the labor market bids down their wage. Okay, so their wages fall as well. But when high skill workers and low skill workers are imperfect substitutes, high skill workers operate in a kind of different labor market, connected but different uh, labor market than low skill workers. And so they're shielded uh, from that competition. Um, I will take one more minute, if that's okay, just to give one last uh, policy insight from the paper that I think is uh, very useful to think about, um, which is which was a, a simulation about this uh, policy of land value capture. So in Bogota, you had this big change in transit infrastructure without any complementary change in zoning laws. Okay, so what this meant is that in the data, I saw house prices going up. I didn't show you this, but it's, it's all in the paper where accessibility improves, but I see zero changes in housing supply. What I do instead is, is base, uh, run a simulation of a class of policies that's been very uh, successful in Asian cities uh, of a development rights sale, where what the government does is say, okay, now near stations, developers can build taller but instead of just giving that away, they're going to auction those off um, uh, to developers. And so I assume the developers are competitive and they're basically going to bid the value of those uh, and, 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 and pay for them. OK, and those that can be used to finance the construction of the infrastructure and also to increase housing uh, uh, supply in places where it's most needed. OK, and so the key take, this is the last slide, the key takeaway, um, I think, first here is that if the uh, city had implemented a complementary zoning policy like this, this land value capture policy, well, the welfare effects, the bang on the buck that they would have got would have been much higher. So overall, if they had allocated these permits based on where accessibility improved, um, the most they would have had around 43% uh, higher welfare gain for exactly the same uh, am amount of spending on the infrastructure. And the revenue from those uh, permits would have would have covered between four percent and twenty percent of the capital cost of building uh, the the system.
Okay, so so this the ma the main insight from this is that there's a large complementarity to cities pursuing a unified uh, transit and land use policy. I will stop there. Great, thank you so much, Stephen, like um, for both of your uh, lectures and presentations. I think uh, all of us learned uh, a lot in those, and I think uh, a lot of great questions coming through in the Q and A that you've both been extremely efficient in answering. So I'm going to pick up on on some of the ones that came up a couple of times uh, as we go through now. But before I do that, uh, I did want to uh, invite all of our live participants, uh, if you would like to ask a question, to now uh, raise your hand. Um, and also anyone else in the broad audience, if you do want to come in and ask a question live, I think you should be able to uh, raise your hand as well. And Greg should be able to find you um, if you want to ask a question. Uh, virtually in person. Um, but anyway, before we get to that, I'll kick off with with three that I've sort of picked up coming through on the chat that relate to sort of how the model deals with like certain policy questions um, uh, that are quite interesting. So the three that I picked out, uh, and I think you've given some answers already, but if you could just expand on these were uh, sort of COVID and working from home and how that might affect sort of urban form and, and how we think about these models. Um, how we might be able to use these models to look at climate applications, so sort of things around the impact of flooding or sea level rise or air quality, that kind of thing. Um, and then the impact of urban transit infrastructure on women's mobility, uh, particularly in Asia and Africa. Um, so if you could, in the meantime, comment on those, and then I'll come back with further questions, and hopefully we'll have some some live questions too. Thanks, Vicky. Maybe I could uh, speak to the uh, COVID question because I've been working on that to some degree. So it's really a great question, and there's still a lot of uncertainty as to how much working from home is going to stick. Um, you know, we, we've all heard recent stories of Amazon, for example, uh, requiring people to to return to work and so on. So there's still an area of a lot of uncertainty. But I would say two things. First thing is um, one of the key things about working from home is that as workers stopped commuting into city centers, that led to this collapse in demand for locally non-traded services and goods. As you walk around London, you see that very clearly. A lot of coffee shops closed during the pandemic, didn't reopen, or store occupants changed quite a lot between the pandemic. And that actually suggests that when we model cities, it's important to think about not just commuting to work, but uh, consumption possibilities. And so I've been working on a project with Yuhei Miyauchi and Kentaro Nakajima, where we look at that with Japanese cell phone data. And so the key idea is um, workers often follow a travel itinerary. When they commute into work, they stop off along the way to go to a restaurant after work or to meet somebody at lunchtime or they, to get a cup of coffee on the way to work. And so you don't just travel from home to work, but you actually follow a travel itinerary. And what those travel itineraries do is they actually provide micro foundations for these uh, consumption externalities. You know, it's precisely because you stop off to consume non-traded services that when you work from home, there is this collapse in demand for non-traded services in the central city because people who work in finance are not going out to restaurants and coffee shops. And so I think that's one sort of important uh, insight from COVID and that, and that he'll, he'll highlights more generally that these consumption externalities can be important in understanding uh, city structure. And then the second point I would say is Esteban Rossi Hansberg, Charlie Porcher and Ferdinando Monte have a really interesting uh, paper on multiple equilibria and uh, working from home. And what they argue is that, you know, we all know in um, economic geography models, if you have multiple equilibria, if you have a big shock, that shock can shift you between equilibria. And they argue that COVID-19 uh, was exactly an example of such a shock. That before the pandemic, we had Zoom, but we weren't really using it, or Skype, we had Skype, we weren't using it that much because we didn't really know how good it was. And so everyone was commuting into the office. What the pandemic did is it forced us to experiment with Zoom and Skype. And we sort of found out it was sort of better than, than we thought it was. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect substitute to in person, but it's much better than we thought. And so they argue that there was a sort of shift between multiple equilibria with temporary shock of COVID had this sort of permanent shift between multiple equilibria. And in particular, they argue that's different in big versus small cities. Um, but, but I think, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty a lot of the adjustment hasn't yet occurred. You know, a, a big, big challenge is if working from home does stick, how are we going to reallocate uh, office space in central cities away from commercial to residents? That's often costly, controlled by zoning and so on. So I think there's a lot of great research questions are still there to look at. And then Nick, I'm sure you probably want to say something to 
uh, you know, the climate or urban transit, I'm also happy to say more, but you, or you may want to say more about working from home as well. I'm happy, if you're done, I'm happy to, to, to go on. Yeah, please, uh, please. Yeah, it'd be great to hear what you think. Yeah, no, so I'll, I'll start with the women. That, like, I think that's an area that is that attracts a lot of uh, policy interest um, and and some work I've started to, to, to see on that. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, you, you could think about this as the model that I presented was taking Steve's and adding heterogeneity along one dimension of income. But you could imagine using exactly the, the, the same type of tools to think about um, heterogeneity in terms of gender. Um, you could, and that, there, I think, I think what would be really interesting is, um, so using the similar framework that, that, uh, that, that, that I use, like the commuting elasticities may be very different between men and women because women may value flexibility. They, they may need to like, if they're the ones who take primary, uh, child, uh, you know, care, care duties if their kid is um you know sick and they have to go home they may need they may value being close to home more than uh men basically so that may be some micro foundation for why uh, uh why those parameters would be different across different groups um but i also think more gen you know steep my project think only about travel in terms of going to work because that brt was really primarily used for long trips and for trips to 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 work um, but when you think about women and time use and all of these questions, I think having data on like travel diaries to see the sorts of trips that they make um, uh, and how this interacts with kind of uh, family and, and household responsibilities, I think that 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 is really, really, uh, really interesting and important. Um, yeah. And for climate, there's I agree completely. There's there's it's a really important area. Um, there's also a lot of research interest, a lot of donor funding interest in this kind of area, which is another other other reason to be be working in here. Um, I'm not sure that there's that much research so far within cities, which is which is good. There's a lot of research across cities, as um, one of Steve's co-authors, Esteban Rossi Hansberg, has a whole suite of uh, models using similar. Uh, tools, but we call it economic geography. So thinking exactly sim similar mathematical structure, but thinking about um, equilibrium across cities rather than within. But you can imagine using those sorts of frameworks to think about the effects of flooding. It may affect amenities. It may affect productivities. Um, and there are a bunch of interesting questions, I think, around informal settlements and flooding risk um, and an interaction also between uh, climate and the government response so governments can create kind of moral hazard by continuing to bail out areas that that, that are subject to uh, to climate shocks and alan alan Xiao at uh, stanford has a very interesting paper on um look trying to understand those kind of effects on developer behavior in the context of jakarta where they're thinking about um building a seawall i think they they, they built one some time ago and I would just follow on from that. I agree with everything that Nick said there, but just that those kind of questions about sustainability and coastal flooding are really, really important in the urban literature. If we think about many big cities, you know, London, New York, uh, you know, San Francisco, uh, Dakar, are very coastal locations, and some of them are particularly vulnerable to coastal flooding, like Dakar. And so this is a really, really important policy issue going forward. And thinking about, you know, to what extent do we want to build seawalls? To what extent do we want to let economic activity reallocate? And the cost of reallocation depend a lot on whether we think is Dakar productive because of something about that location, in which case, if we move people, productivity will go down, or is Dakar productive just because everybody's concentrated in Dakar, in which case, if we move Dakar 50 miles inland or to a higher location, that's not necessarily going to have a big impact on productivity. So again, thinking about how important migration is of economic activity as an adaptation mechanism you know, the costs of that depend a lot on your view as to how strong agglomeration forces are versus fundamentals and things. So I think there's a lot of really great questions there. And it's just a really pressing public policy issue. And that's clearly going to be on the agenda for, for, for years to come. Um, and as, as Nick said, Esteban has a great series of papers with Klaus Desmet and other co-authors looking at looking at these questions and a, a really, really fascinating area. Great. Seeing as you you mentioned migration, I'm going to pick up on the the other immigration question that was asked. So, 
um, if if one or both of you could expand a bit on how immigration into cities is introduced and studied within these models. Um, and another question we had were, are real wage rates and transportation facilities the only factors that determine whether households move to a specific city? So maybe just expanding on that question as well. And a last, last call to anyone who does want to ask a live question. I know these models can be quite technical and intimidating, but really welcome um, any, any live questions uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes. Those are really great questions. I mean, maybe if I just go first on the, or Nick, Nick, do you want to go first? I'm happy to talk about the immigration. No, 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 no. you go, first. We're, we're in a role yeah. with you go first. Yeah. So okay, cool. Um, so yeah, no, I th think Vicky, that's a great question. It uh, probably hasn't been enough work on immigration within cities as there should be. There is of course a very important line of work about segregation by income, uh, education, race, ethnicity. Um, and that obviously connects with immigration to the extent that Immigrations are from different racial groups or different ethnic groups, different education groups. Um, you know, I haven't seen a lot of work on where immigrants choose to locate uh, within cities at a fine spatial scale. There's obviously a long history of work in labor by David Card in particular, where initial um, immigrant networks are used to predict where future waves of migrants choose to locate. Um, and in principle, like one could imagine seeing that effect at the uh, local uh, city level. I think one area where it would be very important, and here there has been some work, is, um, as I mentioned in my talk, several people find that endogenous amenities are, are very important in thinking about the impact of shocks on cities. And if you think about a wave of immigrants coming into a city who have different preferences, um, those endogenous amenities can provide a really interesting mechanism for, um, for kind of welfare effects and distributional consequences. So, for example, if a bunch of immigrants move into a neighborhood, that may shift the composition of amenities of local stores of local goods towards the preferences of the immigrants, which might be different from the preferences of people who were initially located in that neighborhood. And so, for example, Cecile Gaubert has a related paper with gentrification where she doesn't look at immigrants, but she looks at the idea that in the US has been a secular increase in income inequality. If preferences are homothetic, rich people demand different goods. Uh, and in particular, she argues that the goods demanded by rich people are often supplied in central cities, like really high end restaurants or theater or culture, cultural goods. And so as inequality goes up, that means that the rich start to concentrate downtown because they really value those types of goods. And that changes the composition of goods provided to other people who may not value like fancy sushi restaurants as much as extremely wealthy people. And so. Um, you know, that gentrification can, can have income distribution effects through the composition of public goods, as well as through land values. And that could matter for immigrants as well. I think it'd be terrific to see kind of more work on immigration and how immigrant uh, networks diffuse. Um, Rana Bramitsky and Leah Booston have some good, really you know, important work uh, in the US on immigration over time, but they've mainly, again, focused across cities rather than looking within cities. Um, so I agree that would be really interesting um nick nick do you want to say anything on, on those two questions or sure i mean reveal but i tried to do a project on this in uh in jordan a, a few years back so i think it's really it's really uh in uh it's a really interesting question again so you in terms of frameworks you could just i'll same answer as i had before you could take the model i showed you could have different groups they would be natives and non-natives and you could imagine that um before there, there's no natives in the city, there's a suppose there's both natives and non-natives in the rest of the world, but um, there's an infinite migration cost for the native for the non-natives to move into the city. So initially there's only natives in the city, and then you could imagine some exogenous shock that reduces the migration cost for the non-natives to come into the city, and then they would come in and then you know and how what do i think that would actually represent it could represent like a refugee influx so in our context we were thinking about what was the effect of the syrian influx of refugees into jordan trying to get data across different neighborhoods in uh, in amman to see where they went and infer from that like what, uh, a lot of these questions to do with what steve was mentioning so what do they value compared to natives and then what were the effects on uh, house prices, kind of congestion effects like that. And then we're interested in in spillover effects. So if you have one neighborhood where there's a ton of influx of refugees, either because house prices go up or because of preferences, maybe natives don't like living next to non-natives, na you know, the people who live there may, may move out. 
and then you may end up in this very different equilibria where those neighborhoods are, are, are very different. You know, the short answer to a lot of the the the, the 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 question, these kind of questions, and some of the questions in the in the chat were all variations of the you know, what if could we add X? Like, can we can we use these models to to answer Y? And I think the answer generally is that yes, if you can kind of go step by step, maybe I would always start with the framework that Steve showed. That's kind of the the simplest uh, blueprint. And then just think, what are the ingredients that I need to incorporate slums or to incorporate natives and non-natives and try and write down that model. And then at the end of that model, Steve does this very elegantly in all of his papers. He says, OK, if I observe this exact data, then I can solve this model. And he has very nice appendices which show very clearly exactly how you do that. And I just recommend I'd recommend to you, as I recommend to my grad students, to try to follow that process. Right. Re when you actually do research, you don't say you know, the stuff that I showed you today was the end product of a lot of different iteration. And you always start from the simplest model, add one ingredient at a time, figure out exactly what, how you solve that model, what data you need. And then you can, re you know, then you can answer the question, is this feasible uh, or or not feasible? Great. Thank you so much both. Victor, I see you've got your camera on. I don't know if that means you have a question, but please do come in if you do. Uh, thank you so much for the presentations. Thank, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to ask a question. I can't really see myself, so I don't know if I look bad or or not. Um, so my name is Victor Milonis. I, I currently split my time equally between the World Bank and the IMF. Um, uh, I had a question on the on Nick's model. Um, I heard sufficient statistics, and my mind went straight to marginal kind of um, – uh, measuring the uh, the impact of marginal changes in um, commuting costs. So I was just wondering um, whether you could say something about how we could think about non-marginal changes in in this model, whether there's a way to 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 incorporate those and to analyze those within within the framework of the model. And um, I had a comment as well on the welfare analysis. Um, first, because people did ask about climate. Um, my um, idea was also to see whether we could incorporate, since we now have more people commuting, um, you mentioned something about travel times potentially going up. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether it would also be um, useful to extend the welfare analysis to include all those accident-related, congestion-related, road damage-related externalities that might result from having more people on the road for longer or or just people on the road for longer. Um, and then it, it the your finding on inequality uh was was quite um interesting and, and thought provoking. I'm just wondering whether like how we how we can talk about welfare uh changes given that so you talked about positive welfare effects, but but it seems like in the case of workers being imperfect um, substitutes, those changes are regressively distributed. So they benefit um, mostly the high skilled and uh, presumably high, higher earner um, workers. So I'm just wondering how we can reconcile those two, those two findings um, on inequality and, and aggregate welfare. Sorry about the long question. No, no, no. These are great. Thanks for paying such a uh, careful attention. Thanks for the great comments. So, yeah, on the first uh, question, it's uh, so on about marginal versus non-marginal changes. You're exactly right. So the sufficient statistics result holds under certain assumptions on the model. So the efficiency, but second, it holds only for a vector of small changes in travel time. So imagine that I change all travel times in the city by some amount, but no more than like three minutes. Then that approach is going to hold uh, for, for that for small changes. And you're exactly right. That's not going to hold for larger changes, because when you think about mathematically what the expression that comes out of there is, it says, I'm going to weight all of those small changes by the fraction of people who are traveling along those commutes. Right. And so when you think about what that means, it says, I'm going to fix exactly what people are doing today. And then I'm going to add up the time that they would save if they don't change any, any of their behavior and they stay on exactly those commutes. That's all that approach is going to give you. It's simple. It works for small changes, gives you a lot of uh, insight. But then you have to use the model to do the non-marginal changes. And so that table that I showed, which is in the paper, the comparison of the value of travel times, they 
things. Marginal changes, that's the value of travel time savings with the non-marginal changes. That's allowing, you know, it's, it's feeding in exactly what happened. There's no approximation. It can be large, it can be small. It's going to always give you the exact uh, effects of the, of the policy. Um, congestion and accidents and other things that can totally be included. I included congestion. I find that it, it doesn't change things that much. And, and that's in the paper. But again, an emphasis on the data that you have. So if you if you want to include congestion and accidents, you want data on how congestion changed, how accidents changed on routes where the BRT came in, where it didn't come in. Right. So it all depends. It's it, it all depends about data. And then if you don't have the data, that might be fine, but you should just caveat it with, you know, maybe we're underestimating the welfare effects if in other studies we find that formalizing transport reduces accidents. Um, and then, yeah, for the inequality effects, definitely as you're, you know, I reconcile those two by saying, at, you know, overall the thing is lifting all boats. So everyone's getting, everyone's better off. It's just that high skill are, are benefiting more. And so inequality is also going up, but average welfare is also is also going up. Great. Steve, anything else to add before we, we close? Uh, no, I think that was a great discussion and it's been great for all the questions. Thank everybody for all the great questions and feedback. And I guess we're hitting right on time. So now's maybe it may be perfect just to end. And I agree with everything Nick said. Awesome. Well, thank you both uh, so much for your time today. And thank you to the audience for your really, really insightful questions. I think this was uh, a really, really great session. And I agree. One of the participants said we, we should be extending the sessions on modeling to two hours. So we'll, we'll definitely think about that for, for the next time we do this. Um, but yes, just to uh, finally say that uh, all this material will be available on the website. So I think the slides and the reading lists already are. Um, uh, but the lecture recording will be uploaded by tomorrow as well. Um, and yeah, we really look forward to seeing many of you next week. So thank you all and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.